OK, so. Um, this is the I think the uh, seventh of our series of webinars that we've been running since around about May. Um, not one next week on IP searching uh, with patent seekers, which should be which should be very interesting. Uh, we're likely to do maybe one over August, we think, or maybe a summer break, but we'll be back 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 in the autumn planning our next one with uh, a firm of um, uh, called Leighton's who, who work on um, innovation funding. So that'll be about R&D tax credits and patent box funding and the like. So again, hopefully that'll be of interest to some of you, all the people that you know. So please, please join our future webinars. OK, so um, today's topic uh, is IP strategy. Um, and I'm very pleased to, 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 to say we have a, a guest speaker, Simone Ferrara, one of our clients from Vnova. He'll be speaking uh, later with uh, John Paul Rooney. Um, I'll let John Paul introduce himself. Um, John Paul may pipe up with comments uh, through the first part of the presentation. The first part of the, of the presentation will be me and, and JP talking about general topics of what of IP strategy, and then Simone will talk to JP about some real life experience, um, which hopefully will be you know really practical and, and interesting for all of you out there. So. Um, what is IP strategy? Um, it's obviously a plan of how IP will support a business. Um, but I guess the key point I wanted to make here was that it's the business strategy which dictates the IP strategy, not vice versa. So, uh, um, you know, you need to really be starting with a particular goal in mind and an IP strategy without a business strategy di dictating it uh, is often something that will wither and die. Um, and the other thing to say is that it's it's really a process and in, in that don't think of IP strategy as being some sort of document or some sort of finished uh, uh, pro, um, you know, uh, a document or just a, a finished thing. It's a it's, it's really to do. The main thing is to do about the processes within your business, the way you think about IP, not necessarily the end product, if you like, of the IP strategy per se. So I think a lot of the trick in, in getting an appropriate IP strategy is, is, is getting your colleagues on board and getting the rest of the business to understand how IP can work for them. And we'll be talking about that more throughout this throughout this webinar. Thanks, Jim. I'm just going to come in there and say Go hello. Uh, it's JP here, uh, one of the Jim's colleagues at Withers and Rogers. I think the vast majority of our clients really do understand that the business strategy comes first. But where I most often see clients getting it the wrong way around is when they're quite new to IP and they're quite small, maybe a small, very small business um, or an individual inventor when the IP strategy is everything and they think if they get the IP strategy right, everything's going to be a success. So part of our challenge in that situation is to turn them around and understand the business comes first. Probably the people they've got around them is also very important. And to, funnily enough, relegate the IP part of it down the list of priorities until the business parts are organised. So, totally agree with that point, Jim. That's JP, absolutely. So here are, here are some of the sort of nuts and bolts of what an IP strategy may consist of. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are the main ones. Um, and if you like, this is the end product. But as JP said, it's really, really important to understand that the business strategy has to come first and this all this stuff flows from that. So you might have a filing strategy in terms of registration of all the traditional IP, registered IP rights. I've listed two of them there. Design registrations is another one. Uh, and all of the, the nuts and bolts around filing strategies, which is, of course, what we do as patent attorneys and we help our clients with that. And you can get sometimes a little bit focused on that side of things. But it's really important to, to, to have a holistic IP strategy which covers all of the other things I've listed there and maybe more. So thinking about enforcement, in other words, you know, what is your strategy in terms of uh, enforcing your registrations, your registered rights or indeed unregistered rights? Are you going to be selective? Are you going to be enforcing at all? Can you afford to enforce? I mean, a lot of small clients really can't can't afford enforcement, um, but that that's not a good reason not to have IP because, of course, they may be in a position where they're entering into into a collaboration or even an exit where they're bought, where the, you know the acquirer of that business does have the muscle to enforce. So it's important to sort of think about the enforcement side of IP strategy from the very beginning to understand how you're going to react to infringements. 
Um, monetization, how to make money out of IP. Is it, you know, by way of licensing or, or assignment or, or any other different ways of licensing uh, or making money out of IP. Um, what are you going to do about third party IP? So that's that's IP of your competitors. Um, how are you going to approach that? Are you going to pay any attention to it? Are you going to look for it? Are you not going to go looking for it? All these questions need to be thought about. Um, and con confidentiality, in other words, trade secrets. Uh, are you going to have particular trade secrets, things that you may choose not to patent and not to publish to keep keep secret? If you're going to do that, you need to think long and hard about it and put in place um, systems to make sure that those trade secrets don't escape. It's not an easy option, trade secrets. And again, it's something that needs to be thought about from the very beginning. Okay, so I have to credit Simone for this. Thank you, Simone, which <laughs> prompted this picture from the conversation we had recently. And 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 I think this is a, a, a important point to make, which is that IP strategy really touches on so many parts of the business. You can think of it as almost being at the hub of of the business, in that it touches on all of these different business functions: legal, financial, commercial, technology, and and, and as, as Simone will probably touch on later. It's really important that if you're in the IP function that you're able to speak the language of these different business functions. You know, legal will want to know about the regulatory risks or the legal risks, financial will want to know how much it costs or how much we stand to gain in terms of royalties. Commercial will care about, well, what, how does this get, get us the next contract? Um, and the, the technology side of the business might be interested in understanding what that means for them in terms of the direction of their R&D. So all of these elements, uh, all of these business functions have a have a stake in the IP strategy. And I think it's as Simone will probably explain later. It's very important that the IP function can speak their language and 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 has um, a, a good line of communication with all of these functions. So I touched on the on one element of your IP strategy being a filing strategy. This is, so this is filing, registering of uh, of of patents, trademarks, designs, uh, and the like. Um, and I've just put down a few thoughts on on the things you need to think about, the whys, the whats, and so on. Um, and 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 by far the most important in my mind is the why. Uh, and and as as JP says, off you know sometimes we have clients that come to us saying, oh, we've got this great invention, we need to file a patent. And the first question I ask them is why? Because sometimes they've not thought about that. And it's absolutely crucial when you're going down this road to understand what it is that this IP registration, because it costs money, what's that going to do for the business and have a really clear idea on the strategy? Because that, from that, the answer to that question uh, gives you the answer to so many of the subsequent uh, processes and things you need to think about. So I've given a non-exhaustive list of a few things that you might answer that question with, which is the why. Are we looking for a monetization strategy? Are we looking for a keep off the grass strategy, which I'll explain in a minute? Is it a defensive IP or portfolio? What you know, what's this IP portfolio for? Absolutely crucial to ask that question at the beginning and continually ask yourselves that question because things will change for you. Um, so it could be at the beginning of your process, you have one strategy and you move to another in a couple of years. So be be prepared to, to flex, but always ask yourself, keep on asking yourself the question why. <clears throat> I think coming, coming in there, Jim, I'm really pleased that Simone's with us today because in the five years that I've known Simone at Vinova, I think the, the strategies changed and developed as the business has changed. And Simone's brought in different aspects of the why into into Vinova and, and the decision making. So hopefully we can get Simone to touch a little bit more on the, on some of those aspects from from his experience at doing it in the real life with Vinova. Thanks JP and and then then it's the what. So you've made the why decision then the what. Well this is um, how to identify, you know, the types of things that you want to be protecting and this is obviously something where we can help, but it's it's you know it's important to have that kind of culture within your business uh, and, and an educated uh, workforce who understand what an invention looks like, what a trademark looks like. Um, not always obvious to them, uh, and a lot of engineers. It's, it's it's amazing how many inventors I've worked with who have had a basically a brilliant invention that they thought was just a run of the mill. Well, that's what I do. Well, actually, if if you've got a a bunch of um, 
engineers who are educated about what what is and isn't patentable, then you'll be amazed what you know what can come out of the woodwork. So um, you know having a process for identifying identifying, but then once you've identified a bunch of inventions, you've got them then to think about well how do I go about selecting which which ones to go ahead with because you probably can't afford to to protect every single innovation that happens within your company assuming you are innovating um, so you need to come up with some sort of a way of rationalizing and, and mapping out well how do i how do i select say the inventions um, and and it's always worth bearing in mind that patents in particular are not really so much about your own products or well, depending on your policy your strategy of course if, if you have a monetization uh, strategy then the way to select is to think about well what does the competition care about what does the market care about you don't really care about what your own particular products are at a particular time uh, the other way of, of looking at uh, the patents is well you know, mapping them onto your particular product so we have a new product coming out it's, it embodies an invention it's very clever we want to use that patent to uh, get a monopoly for, for for that particular product so that's fine but it's not always the, the best way of of selecting your your um your uh, your inventions and so think about that uh, again it's all driven by the why question and are you looking at, at protecting your competitive advantage in today's market or next year's market or or a market in 10 years time um, really crucial questions because again it really dictates how you go about driving your innovation uh, selecting where to do your R&D and where to be spending your money registering Then there's the question of where, um, you know, do I select, uh, again, patents, nobody can afford to patent every country in the world. So you need to think about where you're going to go about selecting uh, your your markets uh, or your, the places to register. Not always, all, not always easy. Do you look at the main markets for your product? Um, and often just getting a patent in, in one or two major markets is probably enough. But on the other hand, look at where your competitors manufacture because of course if you have one competitor in one country um, who only has manufacturing in that country then maybe a patent in that country alone is all you need so again you need to think about who the competition is and again going back to the why question uh, what's the purpose of this patent and that will dictate where you want to um, where you want to register I put ports there as another another interesting one in that in that you could say that if you got a patent in Singapore and, and, and Holland, you've covered, you know, given the, the size of the Rotter, Rotterdam and Singapore in terms of world trade, um, you probably covered a good a, a good portion of the world's market of, of stuff. So if your if your product is a thing that's being shipped around the world, maybe that's a good way of thinking about it. Um, I like patents, go for it, JP. Uh, but I like the story there where uh, this. I think one of our clients makes very large pieces of earth moving machinery and the only way their competitors from the Far East can get the competing products into Europe is through, I think it's Rotterdam, because it has the only port that's deep enough to take a ship that can be loaded up with this particular equipment. And so their strategy was quite simply just get the patent protection there and then they stop at source all the uh, all imports from outside of Europe. Simple, but yep. very effective. Absolutely. And then once you've got there, you've got down to the sort of nitty gritty, down into the weeds of the how, um, which is important because it has a big impact on uh, on on the cost and uh, and how you structure your company. So, for example, um, are you going to be insourcing? In other words, doing all the all the patent registering yourselves by employing people. To do it for you are you going to outsource it to patent attorneys like us or are you going to do a mixture and in our experience um you know most most of our clients move on a journey from fully outsourced and then when, once you get to a certain size then sometimes they'll bring in some internal resource and um and then um you know uh, as you get to a larger company often they end up with a sort of a hybrid system where they have internal resource plus they rely on the on, on outside attorneys so again you'll be going through a journey and you may well start from a fully outsourced process but then you may you may evolve over time um by the way simone please do do feel free to to pipe up as well you will be i'll be introducing you shortly but please don't don't hesitate if you want to pipe up at any point sure sure uh, thanks thanks um 
so filing mechanisms i'll just touch on you know again there are various ways of going about registering patents i've listed two of them there again think about that because that has an impact on the cash flow because the finance department will want to know how much this is going to cost and there are ways and means and i did a whole webinar on it a few weeks ago there are ways and means of delaying or deferring costs which I've, of which i've listed two there so that will obviously have to come down uh, into the into the how and is an important element uh, and another thing I've listed there is a renewals provider. Uh, patents, trademarks, designs have uh, and mostly annual renewal fees payable every year. Think about how you're going to go about um, doing that. We have a Withers and Rogers renewals business that can that can do that for you. But that's something that is worth thinking about. So I've just listed here a few IP strategies that I've come across in my time. Uh, it's non-exhausted, but you know I think most of the main ones are covered here. And I'll just give you a quick run through. And here are some things that work for some people to some companies. I think the keep off the grass strategy, as I call it, is really to me is the, in many ways the gold standard. It's the, it's the way to me, it's the most cost effective way of using IP, uh, because I think it's really the one that, that, that makes the, the, the largest amount of money and typically because what we're, talk, what we're talking about here is using IP to have to maintain a monopoly on your product or service. Uh, yeah, so you get a larger market share, hopefully 100% market share, uh, and you can charge more money for it. It's very simple, uh, and that is almost certainly the most effective way in using patents in my in my experience. Um, and you know, there's no you know typically you, you may need to do a bit of enforcement, but hopefully the, the the IP itself acts as this keep off the grass sign. So you're just keeping the competition down. So that, that um, makes me, that makes me think of uh, the days when I worked at AstraZeneca. Uh, making pharmaceuticals and every year we would get a uh, talk from the big bosses about how the business was doing and they'd always show a graph of a blockbuster drug that was coming out of patent and the graph would literally have a cliff edge on the profits as soon as the drug came off patent and so that I guess that was my first taste of this keep off the grass strategy because that pharma company used the patents to to be the exclusive supplier of a particular drug. And whilst the patent was in force, they really made hay. But as soon as the patent came off, uh, got to the end of its 20 year term, that was pretty much it for that particular drug. The next one is mutually assured destruction, as I call it, which is a situation which you sometimes get typically in a duopoly with two two companies dominating a market where they each have a massive pile of, of patents or registrations pointing at each other and they never kind of pull the trigger, hopefully. Um, it tends not to work in any in any business or with, with more than two in my experience. Uh, but that's that's a strategy that works in, in some business, in some markets. David and Goliath is one that I've come across a number of times with some of my clients. And it's it's it, the point here is that if you're a small company, your IP can be the ticket into a collaboration with a Goliath who would otherwise not talk to you. Uh, it's, a, it's simple, but but effective. Um, you know, in, in many situations, a large company just will not uh, will not talk to a small company unless that small company has some sort of protection. Um, so again, uh, incredibly effective and difficult to measure the monetary value of that sort of thing. But it's, you know, it's, it, it, I've I've seen it being absolutely the key the key to a, to a business. Um, the patent thicket is a, is a, is a concept kind of beloved of the Japanese, particularly where they will they will file numerous patent applications, all of which have a pretty narrow scope. But once you've added the, the, the scope together, you, you end up with this impenetrable mass of, of IP rights that is pretty impossible to get through. You can pick off any individual patent pretty easily um, or design around it. But in total, they have a very, very strong protection. And, you know, it's noticeable that's not a, a strategy that's, that's used that widely outside Japan and maybe some US companies do it. Uh, Germans, the Germans tend to file a lot more patent applications per head and per pound of R&D spend. Uh, I did a survey about um, a while ago, which said that the Japanese file something, something like 10 times more patent applications per head than we do in the UK, which tells you something about their strategy. Um, the blockbuster patent is the complete opposite of that. And again, you know, uh, this is all about identifying a, a, a single patent application or single invention that will dominate a market for 20 years and is impossible to design around. They're pretty rare, but when they when they do come along, they're, they're pretty effective. Um, the defensive patent portfolio is something where you are using the patents not really 
really as a tool to use in a, in a, in a negotiation should somebody come knocking on your door saying you're infringing my patent. So again, it's something I've seen um, where the patents are used as a, as a defensive shield, if you like. Um, a collaboration tool, you know, in a more general sense, maybe not a David and Goliath situation, but it can be a tool to collaboration, either identifying people to collaborate with or facilitating one with a, with a, with a, um, with another company. Um, an exit strategy, so you're using your, your IP as being something that's adding value to the business, uh, making it attractive for a sale. Um, patent box is another one um, where you're using your patents as a way of reducing your um, your corporate uh, tax liability. And the final one is we don't do IP, which may, you may be surprised to see on this list, but actually there's plenty of companies out there there with this with this strategy. Most of them have a we don't do IP strategy because they haven't thought about it. That's not great. But actually, we don't do IP because we've thought about it and we're doing it. We're not doing IP for these reasons and these reasons. It's a perfectly rational one. So I'm I'm perfectly comfortable with we don't do IP if it's a properly thought through um, strategy. Maybe your strategy is just to move quickly into the market and be the first mover and make and make make your money and then get out. So it's it, it can work. So I've slightly overrun, so I want to move on quickly so Simone and, and JP can start talking about the real world. Um, but just five quick five steps to an IP strategy. Um, as you can see there, um, get the top brass interested. So there's no point in having an IP strategy which is cooked up in some uh, IP department and never makes it in front of the top brass. And that can happen because often, um, you know, the board, uh, you know, may not be experienced with IP. They may not understand the value of it. They may just think they've got more important things to think about. But I think the key is to get buy in from the board and make them understand that in some cases it can be absolutely fundamental part of their business's success. And that can be a, that can be a struggle. Um, once you've done that, get get an IP audit done, find out what you've got, check what belongs to you. And that enables you to do the third thing, which is identify your competitive advantage, what it's worth to you. Um, you know, uh, what are the barriers to entry, what's worth defending, what's not worth defending, put some numbers to it. And that will help you to sort of formulate an IP strategy that works. Look at the competition. Um, do your searches. Come to next week's webinar it would be a good start. Um, think about the risks and opportunities that, have, that, that are out there in terms of the IP landscape. And then finally, once you've done all that, you can put in place these procedures that I've been talking about uh, and be guided by the size of your company because not, you know, this is not a one size fits all. Uh, small companies clearly have a, a smaller budget. They need to be very selective about things and be a bit smart. Uh, and your, your, your strategy, strategy must evolve over time as your company increases in size and so on. And just to loop back on, always keep your eyes on the prize. Think back to the why, think back to the business case, because it's all about the business plan and your ultimate strategic goals. And keep on checking in with those regularly. And without further ado, I will hand over to JP and uh, Simone. Thank you, Jim. I think that was a really good overview on what is quite a massive subject, but I'm sure it's got us all thinking in the right way uh, for the next conversation, which is with Simone Ferrara, um, who has the perfect job title for this section. He's Senior Vice President of Technology and IP Strategy at Vinova, and Simone has been at Vinova since 2015. Simone trained as a patent attorney in private practice, joined Vodafone 2012 before moving into Vinova in 2015. And I, th I would like to start the conversation with Simone just by asking you, Simone, just to tell us a little bit about what you found at Vinova in 2015, just to set the scene for what happened afterwards. Sure. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, uh, JP, and thank you, Jim, for the for the intro. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah. Well, 2015 was a was a was an interesting uh, um, interesting point in uh, you know in uh, in uh, in the Vinova journey. Uh, Vinova just uh, um, announced very much uh, on a couple of months before I I, I joined um, their technology to the world. Um, 
till then the strategy was very much the business strategy and we did also the AP strategy was very much to keep keep off the radar uh, while we developed the the core technology over the previous four years you know there was no website um, and uh, even the patents were filed in a specific way to avoid being uh, identified and this was a um, a, um, a a key point in, in getting where we were in 2015. So when I arrived in 2015, um, it was it was a point where, you know, our technology was starting to be um, exposed. Uh, people were starting to notice, and uh, and so we had to adapt the strategy to that uh, that specific environment. Um, so the technology at that time was still a proprietary technology. Um, so um, we were trying to um, put our our technology, which is a, a video coding technology, although <clears throat> not just for video, but let's say as a first uh, first start is, uh, is is mainly focused on video, but to put our technology in the wider market and uh, and uh, enable um, enable effectively uh, initial key customer to start, uh, you know, to start uh, um, uh, using our technology. So the AP was very much there supporting it uh, from a point of view of um, of facilitating the negotiation with the customers, but also preparing ourselves for the bigger, uh, if you want, um, uh, the bigger scene. Um, you know, one, one important thing in IP is, uh, is the context. So um, one thing that uh, uh, was kind of mentioned in the in the previous slide was, um, you know, competitor and uh, and uh, and you need to keep in mind the competitor. But I probably I would broaden it up to very much the context of your technology. You know, uh, it's not just what your competitor do, uh, but also what uh, you know what the market expect and what is the expectation for that specific sector. So. I'll give an example. If uh, if my uh, you know if my strategy operate if my company operates let's say in a in an open source environment where um, by and uh, you know and and plays the role of the good uh, kind of cop in the sense I pray it wants to keep uh, you know the 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 AP um, uh, CTAP as a as a bad tool rather than a as a, as an opportunity. Um, and uh, and uh, and wants to keep, wants to, wants to play that game and keep that as uh, as their as their main uh, um, kind of uh, the status, if you want, of the company. Then uh, the don file IP is an important strategy. However, you know uh, you may still want to have uh, some IP in the pocket because you know nobody wants to use a nuclear bomb. But if you're if you know that you're potential enemies have a nuclear bomb, you better have one yourself. You don't want to use it, but you just need to have it. So uh, there may be other ways to do it. And I think IP and strategy in general is not just about an objective or a principle, but it's very much how do you achieve the commercial objective that you want to you want to achieve? What do you put in plan in place to, to get there? So Simone, can I come back in there and say, so sure. when, when Vinova started in 2011, uh, there was some work done on the technology, obviously, um, and that was some of the IP filings were were kept very low profile, so as not to arouse too much interest at that time. And there was no website or public offering of the technology until it had advanced to a point where there was a product to sell. Mm -hmm. that, that's correct. And that's then, correct. It, and at that point, the the mission of Vinova was what to to have a proprietary technology that would perhaps directly compete with the existing MPEG video technologies and perhaps displace and replace those technologies with yep. key, key customers. Yeah, I mean, uh, proprietary, proprietary video codec uh, are not uh, uncommon. Uh, you know, they existed before, um, you know, before, before, before we, uh, we came into, into the scene. Um, you know, typically, uh, since the since let's say the late 80s, um, early 90s, um, uh, video codec became quite complex uh, algorithm that required collaboration with other industry player, and so 
you know, MPEG was born very much around that time to kind of foster this collaboration and bring, um, you know, big player together. And it works very much for, for, uh, for a while. I mean, in recent years, has started to work a bit less due, you know, to uh, natural evolution, I would say, of, uh, of how standard tends to uh, develop and how companies tend to play the game. So, but very much, uh, you know, proprietary technology existed before, you know, along with uh, standardized technology. There are pro and cons. Um, I mean, I give you an example, DivX, which you probably know about it. Uh, we probably used uh, to, um, you know, to do your, um, your, um, you know, so for, for those that are old enough to remember when there were still CDs and, uh, and um, and uh, ripping off, yeah, ripping your own uh, your own music on uh, on a CD, downloaded potentially legally from some uh, uh, peer uh, peer sharing uh, website. Uh, you know, you could uh, you you use typically different codec, not necessarily the, the standard codec, but DivX was one of them. And DivX was a proprietary codec. They have a, a strategy on how to commercialize very successfully. And in the end, they managed to get into into you know into devices with their with their with their codec, which wasn't a standardized codec, was uh, purely uh, based on existing technology, but developed by themselves. So, so, so the competitive line, landscape for Vnova back in 2015 then was a mixture of standardized technology, proprietary technology, and possibly open source uh, technology. Yeah, I mean, we need to distinguish between, uh, you know, from a technology perspective, between what is a format and what is instead a, um, if you want, an implementation. So the format, um, uh, the majority of the format or the successful format tended to be a standard format, very much because of the nature of a format. A format is there to um, enable anyone to uh, comply with that format and create, if you want, an ecosystem around that format. Uh, but there are a lot of implementation that goes from, you know, open source implementation, as you say, to proprietary implementation, to uh, a mix of them. And so uh, we came both with the format and the implementation proprietary at that stage. Uh, and that was kind of the beginning of our journey, if you want. Um, and so the strategy very much followed that at that, uh, that point. Uh, you know, I was lucky enough, to be honest, that, uh, that the company already knew and understood the, the importance of IP. Uh, we had patents filed before the company was funded. Uh, so uh, I didn't have much of a, of a, of a problem in, uh, in uh, how to say, in, in influencing the, 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 the director or the board on the importance of IP. Um, but still, you know, taking the you know the objective of the company and translating them into action from an IP perspective is very much what the IP strategy is, is about. So you mentioned the, the the core format there and then possibly the implementation of those of that core format. Mm -hmm. but how did that then shape your your thinking around the IP strategy and perhaps what what you would file for? Uh, what kinds of technology were getting your interest in terms of patent filings and and where you might have been deciding to make those those filings? Certainly, I think the the um, the the main the main areas that we were looking at at that stage were um, very much still the core technology. It was uh, kind of a first phase of core technology, but as we were moving towards product, we were starting to look also at. Um, you know, protecting aspect of the product and the application of it. So we kind of were a blend, if you want, at that stage. Um, again, uh, I, IP needs to look uh, at the present, but also at the future. And so, you know, you need to have, you know, if you want a vision of where you stand now, but also where you will be, or where other will be, in fact, in uh, in three, four years from, from now or even even longer. And again, another point that was touched by the presentation was uh, also what the value, what value IP gives to your company, in particular for you know for a small startup. That's a quite a quite an important aspect. Uh, you know, um, investor look at IP, in particular when it's a heavy technological field and where you know the the player around are you know investing uh, heavily on IP. 
uh, and so that's that's an important element in the also in the if you want in the in the in the in the strategy of the company at a higher level. And so was the was the IP at that stage being being used to drive the commercial aspects to to show improvements in technology to secure contracts? Yeah, I'm not sure if if IP. I mean, uh, one thing that uh, you know I always say is I'm 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 one of the um, you know, my department is uh, is relatively small currently. You know, we are a small small company, so we rely a lot on external. Um, Supplier to help boosting the team, um, and uh, and uh, you know so uh, the expertise in IP is is very much uh, um, limited internally if you want, uh, and I'm the only one to a certain extent that should be interested in in talking about IP, and yet I'm probably the the only one that if uh, if it comes to the to the to the discussion never talks about IP. I always talk about technology, I always talk about uh, license, I always talk about uh, different aspects, um, trying very much to speak the language of the people that are talking to me. You know, if I talk about IP with someone that doesn't really, um, doesn't really, uh, you know, um, know about 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 IP as a as a tool, uh, I need to translate it into into their language. So, um, you know, the technology is really what what drives, if you want, the AP. The AP is, uh, as I said, is a uh, is very much a commercial tool, uh, which uh, which draws its strength from you know a legal uh, construct, but is a commercial tool, and this is how it should be always interpreted. Um, um, whether you use it for, uh, you know, for defensive purposes, whether you use it for making money, uh, or a blend of the two. So, so it's it's always that the, the key, I think. And and so the technology, Vnova's technology, was having some success back in 2015, 2016. I understand, you know, some of the some of your technology was used for the first 4K uh, broadcast of a football match in Europe. Correct. Correct. And uh, so you guys were hitting the headlines and facilitating that that yep. huge increase in picture quality um, that we we now probably take a little bit for granted. Yeah, I mean, yes, uh, we're at the forefront in in that in that. And again, uh, yeah, so that, that's correct. And and then and since then, I know you've been on a journey um, to to perhaps be more collaborative with your technology and get you know you. Vino were in the headlines towards the end of last year for getting involved with MPEG-5 Part 2. Um, yeah, that's did... correct. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, yeah, so um, uh, I think that's the, if you want, the, the, the third phase of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the strategy. I mean, since the beginning, since in fact I joined, uh, we always knew that, you know, to scale up, and to um, to reach um, you know um, the the masses, if you want, or the the mass market, uh, we had to open up much more than we were at the beginning. Um, so uh, naturally, um, MPEG was the was a forum where we could have you know um, uh, they could have helped us to get to get to that place. Uh, however, in 2015, there weren't the if you want the, the 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 timing and the context wasn't the right one, so we waited for you know for a while, and then in um, in very much in 2018 we decided that was the right time to um, promote this one very much on the push of some of our customer uh, that were um, that um, for which the standardization route was an important element in the adoption, uh, but also. You know, on on our own uh, internal push, you know, we wanted to make our technology more widely available, and that meant changing again the strategy, if you want, an IP strategy, but also bringing the technology along with it. Um, and so, uh, you know, in the last couple of years, we had to, um, you know, we worked together with other key industry player uh, within MPEG to uh, standardize an approach, uh, which is um, uh, which kind of followed the principle of our original um, uh, technology and uh, the purpose of it 
and uh, and um, and uh, and collaboratively uh, we created a, what as you say uh, you know the the, the the latest in fact uh, MPEG standard uh, which um, yeah is supposed to uh, be approved by the end of this year and hopefully that that will uh, take off and that you you'll be rewarded for the the technology that you've brought into play so we we're, we're probably getting towards the end of the time for the formal chat uh, so that we can leave some time for Q&A the, the final question I'd, I'd like to to leave with you is just just if you could sum up what you think strategy means to you um, certainly based on your experiences yeah so uh it's 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 a it's a great thing because I think uh, you know strategy means a lot of things to, um, to 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 many people and I was reading looking uh, watching recently a um, a talk by a an American professor uh, who is um, uh, kind of specializing in strategy not necessarily a peace strategy but in strategy in general and. Um, his 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 uh, his, uh, his speech was very much about the distinction between a bad strategy and a good strategy, and and very much by doing that, what a strategy, what is a strategy. So, um, you know, uh, in, in from from his perspective, and I think he, I completely agree with that. You know, uh, there are three element of a, of a strategy, whether it's a P or not. The first element is uh, the diagnosis element, and if you want, to a certain extent, is what we do when we prepare a patent. We try to identify the problem, and it's key to identify the problem to then devise what policy, which is the second element you want to you want to address, what decision you want to make in order to uh, you know to solve that that problem. And then the third element, which is the most difficult one, but is the key element then in defining the strategy, is a coherent uh, action plan. So, you know, you know what you're trying to solve, you know what you, the way you want to solve it. It may be a right way or maybe a wrong way, doesn't matter, but you know, you took a decision. How do you put that decision in action? And I think that's really a coherent, um, you know, a coherent plan that takes policy and action into one one single place is really what define a strategy. The AP part in that very much plays the role of, uh, um, as Jim was showing, of bringing together the various aspects and having like a like a vision, uh, overall vision of where AP stands in the in the company. So um, I think that's really. Um, if you want the, the, the ingredients of uh, you know of defining a, a strategy and uh, and bring and, and bring it forward for uh, for um, for the success of the company. Thank you very much, Simone. That was superb. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to ask if Jim's still there. Jim, would you like? I'm to still here. I was going to say thank you very much again, Simone. That was really interesting, and and maybe we could open it up to to ask if anyone out there has any questions for any for any of us. I was wondering if you could maybe um, talk a little about. Um, where technology with really long timelines. So you talked about the kind of strategies um, largely around what, what you do with patents if, you, if you're getting them. Obviously, you, you are, they're time limited. <laughs> so if you're talking beyond the kind of 20 um, year horizon and where you're trying to build a portfolio of technology to, to be uh, that you could use at that sort of time horizon. Can you talk a little about what what you would what thoughts on what strategy you might uh, adopt for that sort of approach? Sure. Uh, thank you, um, Dan, for the for the question. Uh, I'll I'll pick it up, but please, Sander, please feel free to um, because this is a very topical question. So, uh, you know, and I will give you an example here. So. Um, in the standard world, uh, you know, obviously one way of monetizing, but it's not the only way, is through, um, you know, having patents that are standard essential. Uh, however, patents are limited to the, you know, to the, uh, to, to in the lifetime, as you mentioned. 
Uh, now, if your focus is purely on, on monetizing patents, then uh, very much your um, your strategy uh, should follow, uh, you know, a, a part of how we maximize the lifetime. Uh, maximizing the lifetime may mean uh, filing an initial set of patents and, uh, for example, continuing to expand the technology. I mean, there are standards that have uh, patents that span 30 year period, even though, as you know, uh, patents can last for 20 years in most, in most jurisdictions. So uh, how do they do that? They keep updating. Obviously, the value, uh, you know, for it is not anymore the core part, but it's it's other elements that kind of keep expanding and, and procrastinating if you want the end of that portfolio. But if you're if you're uh, if you're um, um, if your business is not simply uh, uh, licensing uh, licensing IP and patents in particular, but is also uh, um, either uh, you know selling a product, whether a software or something else, or licensing broadly IP, including know-how, et cetera, then there is a blend of things that you can use to expand that. And again, it's important that uh, you know, the strategy takes into account what it means to keep them together and what it means to separate them. Um, so there is not a, a one size fits all, but in all of these, you need to remember that IP is not just patents. IP includes uh, various aspects, you know, in software may include copyright, may include know-how, you know, the ability to implement something, it's some, it's, uh, it's, uh, and uh, the knowledge of the, you know, of what you need to do in order to make it perform, uh, you know, in the right way is, is also where the value is and possibly from a monetization perspective is where most of the value is. So again, it's, um, it, it, you know the, the 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 patent will give you that legal framework that enabled you to um, you know to monetize and to um, and to gain uh, uh, if you want a um, you know a barrier for other people, but also a, a as I said a tool for uh, for other people to uh, um, understand that you are you know you have you have the power to you know to license what you are what you're planning to but on the other hand the the the, the you know there is a lot a lot more than that and and typically uh, you know trade secrets or uh, you know know how in general are much harder to enforce are much harder to maintain but it needs to be part of the coherent uh, coherent strategy Thank you, Simone. I certainly couldn't have said it better. Um, are there any other any other questions out there? OK, I'll take that to be a no. So. Going, going, gone. So well, anyway, thank you very much, uh, Simone. And that was really fascinating. Really appreciate your time and you know bringing us into the real world and, and some stories from the front line of IP so that was fantastic thank you very much so I'll just sum up with um, a little re repeat of our little plug for next week's IP searching seminar a lot more um, focused I guess but possibly of use to you some practical tips or things that you can do uh, next week um, so without much further ado thank you very much everybody and hopefully see you all again next week Bye now. Thank you. Bye.